as we discuss the uh, lesser known uh, weird aspects on this little virtual tour, Milwaukee Ghost Tour, Odds and Dead Ends. Um, <laughs> let's jump in. Uh, who wants to who wants to tell a story first? Allison T. Who's feeling it? I want to hear what you guys to say. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm saving a question for, on the sticky note for everyone. Okay, let's let's start out with uh, T. T. Uh, let's jump in. And um, what do you want to tell us about? Uh, well, if we can show the first slide that I've got here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a story. It's very cool because I, I've been doing the third ward tour and. Uh, one of the great things about doing the tours is, is people uh, tell you about um, stories. So if you just want to go back, I th think this is a lot. Yeah, yeah, right there. There we go. So um, I've noticed that uh, uh, on the tours, sometimes I'll have firefighters. And my experience has been that firefighters, this is kind of a general statement, uh, are really interested in ghost stories. They have been some of the best guests on my tour. They're always very interested. Um, and after the tour, at least three or four different firefighters have said, you know what's the third ward firehouse, which is right on the river uh, by the bridge, is haunted. Um, and I was like, okay. They've never really been able to tell me specific stories, like who it is that's being seen or what the experience have had, but they're all... Uh, very, you know, matter of fact, like this is a fact, uh, this old firehouse is haunted. So I looked it up quickly today. I don't know a lot about the history, but I found that it was built in 1915 and that's where our firefighting boats were stationed out of and that it operated in some capacity all the way up to 1984, uh, where uh, it was pretty much just a lifeboat station at that point. Um, and then it was abandoned, but right now it's being remodeled to be a three unit condo dwelling. Um, but every firefighter that I've talked to has told me that, yeah, this is a place that's haunted. So the third ward tour is so interesting because so much of the third ward is very old. I'm told one of the reasons for that is actually there was a time when um, a lot of major cities were tearing down old buildings and replacing them with new ones. But Milwaukee was kind of broke. I love this because it's such a Milwaukee story. <laughs> Milwaukee didn't really have a, a lot of money to throw around, so they kept these old buildings, uh, which is great. Um, you know, I really love there's a block uh, near Michigan Avenue near the, the Hilton Garden Inn, and every building on that block was built before uh, 1900. So we've got so many buildings in the third war that might have ghost stories. We just don't know about them yet. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. Um, I love it. And I, uh, firefighters like, well, Lisa, our, um, Madison ghost tour guide, she's a firefighter and she gets to do inspections at places. And she says that while she's doing inspections, um, that's where she'll sometimes hear people tell something like, oh, yeah, uh, we've seen some weird stuff down here, too. And then she'll be like, what? What kind of stuff have you heard? <laughs> uh, and, oh, I just want to say a quick. Dan brought up a good question. Um, there was, you know, on the Third Ward tour, we do talk about the great Third Ward fire of 1892. Uh, and we also talk about the New Hall House fire. Uh, and again, uh, firefighters who are on the tour, um, they know these stories. So they're kind of excited to hear these stories because as Milwaukee firefighters, um, it's stuff that they probably learn about early on in their career from their fellow firefighters. You know, an interesting thing about the uh, New Hall House fire too is, so that's where the Hilton Garden is now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we stayed there, Mike. You know that. Yeah, that's what that's I, I kind of want to get to. And so um, it was a certain room. It was a room like 210 or 310 yeah, or something like that. 326. 326? Mm. That had the stories where, you know, it, it's a nice big room and people had seen weird, weird things there. And it's because if you guys aren't familiar with the New Hall House fire, um, you guys can obviously tell. Sorry, better that than I can. 1881. 
1881. And so in that particular fire was the worst hotel fire in United States history to that point, right? Yeah. And I mean, it was one of the worst fires ever to, to that point. And so uh, it became nationally famous. And there was even a, a folk song about it, which is strange. Uh, there's a folk, folk song about the Lady Elgin disaster as well, which was popular during the Civil War. And then the 1881 fire at the Newhall House has a folk song. <laughs> so, but you uh, know what? One thing I thought was interesting. Sorry, go ahead. So one thing. So that room is where people had the most paranormal activities. This room 326 in the Hilton Garden Inn, and so it's Allison and and me and, and her husband staying there. Uh, and this is a couple of years ago. And so we weren't having anything weird going on. We got the EMF meters. We got the uh, you know the EVPs, the K, all this stuff up there, and. About midnight, I'm like, well, I'm going to go down to the bar. And I go down to the bar, ends up being one of my friends actually was there and they had gone to see a concert that night. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, Alice and I went floating. We did the floating tanks. Those, oh, that yeah, day. floating tanks. We did that yeah. that day too. Yeah, we did floating we tanks doing? and then we did a paranormal investigation. At the and then we had vegan, Scott brought vegan donuts. I yes, forgot it, that. it was lovely. Um, but the thing is, so I go down to the bar. And I'm talking to the bartender. I'm like, you ever seen anything here? And he's like, nah, man. I'm like, okay. And so then I get a couple of drinks in me. And then I just walk to the front desk girl. And I'm just like, hey, um, that's going to sound weird. But have you ever experienced anything? And she's like, well, not me. But some of the guests have seen really weird stuff. And I said, well, what about room 326? And she goes, well, we just had a woman who refused to stay there. Who, oh. who would come. Well. Oh. I want to tell that I want to tell that part too because I thought it was so, so good when you guys came back and told me that because like you guys left and I just like um, was hanging out in the room like I trying to trying to do like my best like helpless female impression <laughs> to hopefully bring on the haunting I don't know um, that that's just like the little scenario I was running in my mind. And uh, then you come back and you have this great story about this woman. I, I know I'm hijacking your story, but it's so great. Okay. So this woman was staying in that room. And then during the night, uh, she hears something in the closet, like an animal. She thinks there's an animal in the closet because it's all this commotion. And uh, so she just like runs out of the room because it's so loud, it's undeniable that there's something rattling around in the closet. And so she went down to the to the front desk and told them about it and they sent they sent people up and of course nothing was found. And then she just would not stay the rest of the night. She took her stuff and I think like tried to doze in the lobby. Is this yeah, they didn't have any other rooms. They didn't have any, this is what got me because yeah. that it's an expensive place and that's a big room. It's a suite. Yeah. And, and so instead of sleeping in this big suite, which you probably spent a couple hundred bucks at least on, she slept in the lobby because she refused to go back in and they had no other rooms available. Yeah. And so to me, that feels real because all instead of going back in, you're like, screw it. I'm just going to stay in the lobby because it's safer here. Yeah, because, <laughs> oh, sure. They looked, they checked the room. It's perfectly safe. I'm not buying that line. I'm not <laughs> going upstairs. I mean that that's a great place with with, with so many different stories uh, related to the 1881 fire. Um, it, even the people that work there, you know, security guards have seen apparitions. Um, everybody seems to know about the service elevator that you just walk up to the service elevator and the doors open without you hitting the button. That's just a thing <laughs> that you're supposed to hit the button to make the doors open, but somehow it knows you're coming and the doors just open. I, I heard that from m multiple employees. So everybody seems to have a, a story um, at that hotel. Nice. Nice. Except All for right. Nothing happened to us. Right. Nothing happened to us. Like, <laughs> oh, I had a couple of good beers. It was weird <laughs> that I ran into my friends there. And they had just gone and like the the guy that wrote the Walking in Memphis song. And I'm like, it's kind of paranormal that he's still popular. But, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's about that's it. Kinda, well, he survived a gunshot to the head. 
Somebody oh, shot okay. him in the head. Getting more more paranormal every moment. Yeah, I was gonna say. So, um, oh, so go ahead. We were we were talking um, before we went on um, about von Trier, and, and I want to hear about your your research into the strange death of the former owner of von Trier. I want to make sure we get to that, um, if that's okay. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I have stories I could tell, but really, I'm bored with my own stories. I want to hear your stories. Sure. Well, this was um, a great exercise in curiosity. Um, you know, I lived in River West for a long time and would frequently be on the east side and hung out in a lot of bars. And I started hearing people tell me this story about an incident that had happened at Von Trier's. Um, and in the first telling, what happened was uh, a guy was jealous of the owner of Von Trier. So he walked into the bar, he grabbed a decorative crossbow off the wall and shot the guy in the bar and killed him. And I was like, okay, good story. <laughs> then maybe, you know, a short time later, I don't know, weeks, months later, someone else was telling me the story. But this time the guy walked outside of the bar, Von Trier's, and there was a guy hiding in uh, behind something across the street and he shot him from across the street and killed him. Then I heard the story again. And this time the guy who shot him was dressed like Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept hearing all these different versions of the same story. And so one day I was walking around the east side and, you know, and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go in the bar and ask them if they can, you know, tell me what's going on. So I went in and there was a, an older bartender and he was like, oh yeah, this story. He was like, let me tell you, I was working this night. So uh, he told me the date because it was close to Christmas, as I remember. Uh, he told me his version and then I actually went to Central Library and uh, went up and got the microfilm for the newspapers for the day that this incident happened. And what actually happened was uh, the owner of Von Trier had closed up the bar. He walked to his apartment building, which was nearby, but it was about a block or maybe two blocks away. And kind of laying there in wait was an employee of his who had a hunting arrow and he stabbed the owner with the arrow. So he actually didn't fire the arrow from a mechanism. He used it sort of as a knife. And for some reason, they couldn't bring him to the hospital, which was right there on the east side. They had to drive him to the south side. And by the time they got there, he had bled to death. Oh, and uh, they never arrested someone in this because they didn't have evidence that this person did it but it looked very likely that it was a dishwasher or something like that who was jealous of this owner because he was having an affair with his girlfriend. Oh. So it's not a ghost story, but it's kind of this urban legend where you hear many different versions of the same story. Uh, and then I, I actually wrote that story up for a publication called uh, The Alcoholmanac. I actually started a, a short-lived column for them that was called The Booze Hound, Oh, yeah. And, uh, what I did was I investigated various stories about bars um, and to determine if they were true or not. Didn't you didn't you write a story about um, the Baron Bottle in not the Baron Bottle in Madison last year, like in January, you came out and I was going to attempt to sort of revive a column. Uh, my working title for it was going to be called Spooky Brew or something like that. And it was going to be about paranormal themed alcohol uh but it's, it's one of those ideas that i had that kind of got lost in the shuffle sure but who knows maybe someday i'll do it but i i have talked to some people that that have told me that someone is actually haunting the bar uh but i don't know many details uh no. it, could be, it could be the owner i mean yeah he didn't die in the bar but he died close by and it was right, right. Uh, his second home pretty much. So. so certainly there is some talk about somebody that haunts that bar, but uh, it looks like it's a haunted bar. Yeah. Be, oh yeah. Oh, totally. It's got great atmosphere, but because we, we don't 
you know, I don't have enough stories um, for that area yet. I haven't, haven't really given it a serious look, you know, like people tell me this and then and I write down my notes in my Evernote and I wait for things to accumulate uh, to make, to make a tour. So, uh, but, but, you know, if we ever have a tour in the, that area, which I'd really like, cause I, I think um, the Oriental is very cool. And I know the Oriental does have some stories, although some people dispute that. Um, you know who I'd like to talk to from the Oriental? The people to talk to would be the people who did Rocky Horror. Oh yeah. And, and, and it's because they have the longest running Rocky Horror in the country. Is it still going? Because that's where I, Alice I, and I, that's where we saw it the first time. I mean, I don't know what the pandemic, but. Oh, sure. No, right. Right. Obviously, um, a sex themed comedy may not be perfect for <laughs> disease spread in time. Well, I read, uh, I wrote an article for The Shepherd, and it was about how um, uh, there was a woman who had done Rocky Horror, and then her daughter was a second generation Rocky Horror <laughs> cast member. So that's how long it's been running. Holy cow. I, well, we saw it in 1993. I think we were there in 1993. Oh, I don't even know. It's so long ago. But I just think that area would be a great area for a, a ghost tour. And I, oh, I, yeah. I hope that anybody that is watching now or later that has stories will, will let us know about yeah. that area or any other area of the city where you'd like to see a haunted history tour. Well, I'm always excited to write one. And I know T is always game as well. So, Allison, let, now let's see what's one of the places that you think um, has not been talked about enough. Okay, uh, well, uh, let's go to my slides if we can. Yeah. Okay, how do I get to mine? <laughs> Hold on. Show slide navigator? No. No, it's... Um, uh, those I are my it. slides. Yep. Yeah. And here comes Allison's. Okay, yeah. So, uh, I, I guess... Um, one one place that I really like that uh, is is along um, near Juno Juno Avenue. Um, so if we did a, a tour in that area, uh, it's one that I'd like to talk about. Now this place is no longer there. The Mother House, which was a huge convent, uh, and they have a, a story about the devil visiting in 1854, and uh, this area was uh, once covered uh, covered the uh, Milwaukee, Knapp, Jefferson, and Ogden Avenue. So it was a huge, it was a huge uh, place where nuns lived. And even um, even our um, our relative La Ling, um, Mike, was there for a time. Uh, one of our relatives, my godmother, uh, was a uh, was a nun there. Um, Wait, she was a nun there. Is that before she met Jeff? Yeah, yeah. I did not. I did not realize that. We have, we have a relative from Guam. Yes. Um, who married like our cousin, and it's funny that she'd been. She would have been in Milwaukee. Yeah. Um, so that must have been, I don't know, like the '60s when she she was there. Um, but former, uh, former nun, they're not allowed yeah. to get married guys. Right. Just, right. Former nun. Uh, but she, contrary to what, uh, contrary to what Pornhub tells you, they can't get married. Yes. <laughs> she, she talked about, you know, after hours when it got dark, you know, kind of running back to her cell at night cause it was so creepy in there. But, but anyway, 1854, there is this story about the mother house, which was run by, um, mother Carolyn. And uh, so she over, over oversaw all the all the people um, who were novitiates looking to become nuns. And all of a sudden, one night there there was something strange in the dormitory. And so she ran to the dormitory to find out what was going on. And all the young nuns to be were really freaked out. Uh, and there was there was uh, this strange liquid on on all their pillows, and then uh, it was in their nightcaps. <laughs> Funny to think of people having nightcaps, but they had nightcaps um, along a table, and they were all um, filled with some kind of viscous goo, and the nightcaps, you know, actually started to dance uh, on their own accord, and then from then on, uh, you know, more. Uh, 
sinister things started happening. They had a dog on campus that mysteriously disappeared. Uh, some of the nuns reported um, being physically abused by an unseen force. And uh, at one time, at one point during mass, uh, this candle lifted up in the air uh, and everyone saw it. So it levitated and then just disappeared. And then they found it later uh, in a, a nearby closet still burning. So there was a lot of strange, I think you would say poltergeist activity, although I think others might think of it as um, more of uh, an oppression, you know, not, not a possession because it's just in the building, um, but kind of a demonic uh, presence that uh, was getting into everybody's business and causing trouble. So they wanted to figure out what was going on and get to the bottom of it. And unfortunately, uh, there was um, a young, uh, one of the young um, novitiates uh, became uh, giddy every time she came into the chapel. And so they noticed that as uh, something strange, that, that she seemed to have some kind of weird, inappropriate re reaction to um, th the actual chapel or uh, religious objects. And we know from podcasts that, that we've done, Mike, that uh, there are uh, four four signs of um, four signs of possession, and one of them is that you have this aversion or strange, inappropriate re re reaction to. Uh, religious objects. Right. Like vampires are supposed to hate crucifixes. Right. Or whatever. So it's, I mean, that's one of the f first signs that really, sh that shows up. I'm reading a book right now about a um, 25 year um, a psychiatrist, uh, or a psychiatrist with 25 years of experience um, looking into such cases and uh, consulting for exorcists. Uh, and, and he, and he says that, that yeah, that's one of the first signs to show up. And that book is D Demonic Foes, if you'd like to pick that up. But anyway, so um, there's a whole book about, about the mother house that uh, I read this story in. And so this, this woman starts to develop these strange uh, symptoms. And um, they find out that there was a, a man that wanted to marry her. And so she didn't want to marry him. So that's why she ran off to the nunnery to, to escape uh, from that social obligation because she didn't want to marry him. But then when they saw that strange stuff going on and seemed to uh, notice that she was in some way involved, they kicked her out so much for <laughs> religious sanctuary. So they kicked her out and then she had to marry this guy. But after that, all the problems, all the weird stuff, uh, ceased on campus. And, um, but one thing that, that did happen, I, I mean, th th this uh, went on for more than a year, about th 13 months of the strange activity. And uh, after it left, what happened is uh, one night in just after uh, whatever this evil presence uh, was left in the chapel. There, there was this an angelic uh, singing and, and lights, and so the the um, people at the chapel, the the nuns, actually developed this practice uh, in in respect for that like uh, angelic intercession. They they actually I forgot what what ex it's exactly called, but they had they would have a prayer vigil there, um, going twenty four seven, and that was even going on when La Ling was there, Mike. So oh. from eighteen fifty four until uh, they took the building down, uh, which I believe was late sixties. Uh, so every every night or actually every day continuously from 1854 on, they had uh, someone in there, some of the nuns in there praying. And then you'd have your shift 
And that's why sometimes La Ling had to be in the corridors after hours because she, she got the night shift or she was just ending, uh, you know, at midnight or whatever, and somebody else was taking over. She'd have to run back to her cell, um, you know, because it was like the middle of the night and somebody would take over that prayer visual. Um, so uh, anyway, that that to me is an incredible uh, story. Uh, where... where um, at least part of the footprint of the convent was is now um, the Convent Hill uh, condominiums. <laughs> but um, in their parking lot, you can actually go see the bells. Uh, and so I've visited those bells on, on many occasions and, and they're still very loud. <laughs> but that's my story of uh, Convent Hill. Oh, awesome. It's, it's awesome. We have a family connection to it too. Right, right. Um, you know, I, I wanted to talk about a place that I feel um, does not get enough haunted notoriety, and it's it's in the Milwaukee area. It's in the um, in the town of McQuanago, which is where Allison and I went to high school, McQuanago High School. Um, and so, I want to talk a little bit about the Rainbow Springs Hotel. And so, uh, Rainbow Springs. Now, this is starting to be built in 1959, and uh, it is on 900 acres of property and it is huge. And there's a famous Milwaukee developer at the time, his name Francis J. Schradel. Um, and he had developed subdivisions, Menominee Falls, New Berlin, uh, Brookfield. Um, he built churches all over. So you know, Francis J. Schradel, he was a, a big deal in uh, Milwaukee area development. And so 1959, he starts building this golf course uh, and lodge on these 900 acres in McQuanago. And it's a very rural area. And so uh, he's building it. It gets a little bigger. And um, then he's like, okay, we have a lodge and we've got the golf course. And those things have opened. Now he's dreaming of this gigantic resort, uh, resort complex, 760 rooms, 600,000 square feet. So it's massive. And they, in the 1960s, they're building this hotel. And they got the golf courses going, but they don't have the hotel going yet. And so people were like, well, you should open up a little bit at a time. And you should uh, you know, keep, the keep building the business so you can launch the hotel and the resort. And he's like, no, I want to have a huge opening. He envisioned a grand opening that Frank Sinatra would be the main event at. And he was wow. even... You know, he was telling his friends that um, one of his friends, uh, a builder in Elm Grove, is like, he was a cocky guy. Uh, he was way ahead of everybody in his thinking. He was a dreamer and he had the guts to try it. And his net worth is like $30 million. So, I mean, he's a guy that's successful. Um, so he moves to the property with his wife. So he lives on a cabin on the property while they built it. And so um, they're building... This, you know, 760 uh, uh, room place, he he thinks it can compete with McCormick Place in Chicago, if you guys are familiar with that. It's a gigantic convention center. And it's his dream, a Rainbow Springs, that it's going to be this golf course convention center. It can compete with the best of Chicago. And we're only, you know, it's 70 minutes outside of Chicago. So he's hoping that people will come there and have their conventions and everything. And you can have, a, you know, thousands of people. And in the mid 60s, the money starts drying up a little bit. The building's built, but then he needs to buy furnishings for the building. And he doesn't quite have the funding to do it. And he gets to the entire 1960s and things are not going as well as they were before when he originally bought it. And so what happens is uh, 1971, M&I Bank sues him and his company for like $8 million. And they say that this is what we need because you're not making good and you you should have opened the hotel by now for the investment you know we put in. And he's like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. In fact, he's like, if I can't open this hotel, no one will. Mm. All right. Mm. 1975 comes around. And finally, the county sheriff has to come in and escort him and his wife off the property. And it gets foreclosed on. He dies in 1976. Now, I read in a McQuanago chief article uh, in the 2000s that he had killed himself inside the property. 
And so that was the legend for a long time. So I wasn't able to find anything that actually backed up that he had committed suicide inside the property besides that article, which we're not talking about the New York Times <laughs> sources here, right? We're talking about somebody who's like, yeah, no, my aunt said he killed himself there. Yeah, that's good. Who's your source? My aunt. She's not a liar. Um, so, uh, you know, I heard that legend. But we do in the nineteen um, in nineteen eighties though it, it's it's an abandoned hotel. If the hotel was built, nobody ever stayed there, and so the best thing they could do is they had the golf golf course open, and as well as every Halloween you would have a haunted house there. And the first time I heard about this place is when I went to go to the haunted house put on by the local JCs, and the haunted house is great um, because it's a scary ass building. Um, and it's a hotel that was never opened. And so my friends used to work at the haunted house. And that's where I first heard that there was real paranormal activity happening there. They'd be like, oh yeah, I don't want to be, I don't want to be alone um, in my room when I got to jump out and scare people. They would like, wanna, they would volunteer for the places where they'd have to be with partners or they, they wouldn't be alone in certain rooms because they would feel grabbed, touched. Hair, hair was always a big one. Uh, a lot of girls that were worked there felt like um, somebody was pulling on their hair and messing with them. They talked about seeing uh, shadows crossing the halls, footsteps, and they'd be like, hey, I'm over here. Uh, you know, they think it was their buddy or they think it was their boss. And, you know, they call to him and there's nothing. There's nobody there. And so it always had that rumor of paranormal activity. And plus the rumor that the guy had killed himself in there. So, of course, I want to go there. And so in uh, 1994, um, or maybe in January 1995, I think it was January 1995, but it was the winter time. And uh, one of my friends had worked at the golf course. And he's like, I can get you in the hotel. You want to go see the hotel? And I'm like, hell yes, I want to go see the hotel. So uh, we sneak in. And he's an employee. So it's technically not trespassing because we're with somebody who at some point has some kind of authority there, but we're, we're walking around the place and this is winter time. And it's really something else because you walk into a ballroom and the ballroom is full, full of snow. There's broken windows and stuff. And you just, let me, um, let me show you some of the pictures that uh, this urban explorer had taken uh, when he went to the rainbow Springs hotel. Let me share my screen here. Abandoned rainbow Springs golf resort. And you can see uh, there was the pool, um, you know, and it, if this place doesn't look haunted, come on, look at that. If that doesn't look haunted, t do tell me what does. Hmm. Um, so we're walking around and really the hotel rooms, like the, the coaxial cable was there for like plugging in cable, but there was no TVs. You know, there were some chairs, um, a couple of beds, but it was like looking at life after people when you would walk in somewhere and there would be snow drifts in the middle of the room and stuff from the broken windows. And this is being January and we're walking through and I'm like, I'm going to see a ghost tonight for sure. The oh, Francis J. Schreider is going to like come out and like goose me or something. And I'm just hoping for it. As we go through, um, we hear some movement or hear some activity, some footsteps. I'm like, that's weird. Um, so we kind of go towards them and we walk into one of the rooms and in one of the rooms, uh, I'm like, you're looking at this room with all the graffiti on it, right? Well, that was like one of the rooms that we were in, except the room we were in had a pentagram drawn on the floor, um, like in chalk. And there was a chicken carcass over it. And I'm like, we just walked into some kind of satanic ritual. Um, and I did not think it was a big deal. I was like, <laughs> so, um, really it was like, whatever, because it wasn't paranormal. It was, I thought it was just kids who listened to too many Ozzy albums and they thought they could make yeah. it come to life. You know, like we kill a chicken over a pentagram. We're totally going <laughs> to finally, we're going to graduate high school, even with our shitty uh, report cards. And so I'm like, nah, this is not real. Um, and then we hear more movement because the thing is the, uh, looked at the chicken, the blood was still wet. So they were still there. And um, we just like, Shh, quiet. And we 
as we heard footsteps and stuff, we just kind of, we like, we did, whoever was sacrificing animals in some kind of satanic ceremony in the middle of the abandoned Rainbow Springs resort, we just didn't want to run into them. <laughs> so we turned off the flashlights, we stayed quiet, and, we just, and then eventually we couldn't hear any more stuff. We got up, we kept on exploring. I wanted to see a real paranormal event um, and not just what I thought were bored farm kids. And um, maybe they had an extra chicken. Maybe they had an extra chicken, but really the rainbow spring, I mean, it, it is an interesting place because, but the thing is, so we're there, we see that kind of weird stuff. And um, then eventually uh, the police come and that's when we thought it was time to leave. Like the police came, the, the car drives by and you see the, the lights flashing through uh, that they would do a check to see, make sure nobody was at the haunted hotel. And so we're like, all right, it's the, it's the five Oh y'all. And then we ran. Um, in interesting thing about that. So I did not think we had a paranormal experience there. Right. And um, a few months later, we go to a place that was an abandoned farmhouse uh, in McQuanago that Allison, I thought you told me that you went there in high school and you called it the gates of hell. And that's where people use the Ouija board. You have a lot of stories about me that I and then you have no recollection of it. You have no recollection of it. And no, you, I have like, no recollection. And so you uh, that I, I that, ever, that I ever tortured you in such a way. Like you did, so I bring a whole bunch of my friends out to this abandoned farmhouse, this burned out farmhouse at the edge at, at right where the McQuana go is I-43 exit or entrance and exit, I-43. And it's gone now because there's a hospital there and stuff like that. But back in the day, it was just farmland before there was Walmart and everything. And it was just farmland, this abandoned farmhouse. So we go out there about 10 o'clock on a Friday night. We have, uh, like, we called it, um, oh, Fright Nights. We'd all go and we get you know a bunch of people and go to this place. And so it's, it's a bunch of girls, a bunch of guys on a, on a Friday night. And so we bring out the Ouija board. I put it down between me and this girl. And there's about 15 to 16 people out there who wanted to check it out. And so uh, one of my friends, as we set the Ouija board, walks up to us and throws a bone on the Ouija board. And he goes, here, use this as an antenna. And I'm like, what's this? The walls of the abandoned farmhouse were filled with animal bones. Mm, and creepy. right. I'm like, what's going on? And once again, I did not think of it as a paranormal experience. I'm like, Kids bored in the farm are just doing stuff they that they, they think is going to upset their Christian parents, you know. And that's what I thought for a long time, until um, the last Bray Road Beast documentary comes out, and then you have the um, you have the uh, animal control officer of Walworth County, Wisconsin, talking about all of the different piles of dead animal bodies that he found in that were near Elkhorn and how he finds that at the time. And I'm talking about, I'm in the early nineties is when we're doing this exploration and the beast of Bray road starts in the late eighties and the sightings continue in the early nineties. And he's talking about finding all of these animal corpses in Woolworth County at the same time. And all of a sudden I'm thinking is was there some, there's some kind of thing like people, because the idea was people were trying to evoke some creature. They're trying to bring some creature over from the other side. That may have been the beast of Bray road. They were trying to open a portal to bring it over. And they were using the animal sacrifices as the, as the power to do that. And so all of a sudden the things that I thought were just bored farm kids got a lot more sinister after that. Um, and so I, I kind of want to talk because I, I feel that, um, you know, I always thought the satanic panic, right? It's all, it's all BS. There's nobody out there who's actually going to sacrifice an animal. And then I walked into two different sacrificial places and then you hear the animal control officer talking about it. It just makes you think a little bit extra like, okay, well, I have been to places where people conducted rituals and I, I can't tell you what it was, but it was also at the same time people are having these kind of, uh, not just cryptid sightings, you know, we were talking about Wildcat Mountain. That's a cryptid setting because you're seeing a beast that people don't think is real or it's supposed to be out there. They're having, they're seeing some kind of supernatural monster sightings. Um, and so putting those kind of connections together, kind of I'm like, I'm like, oh man, I was, the places we were investigating were the, uh, 
we are, you know, we were walking into these sacrifices and I'm like, ground zero, Mike, ground zero. Right. And at the time I just thought it was stupid. I'm like, I want to see a ghost stop. You know, I'm like, these guys have read too much Alistair Crowley. You know, I'm like, what a bore and not realizing that what we were right there. Um, so I just kind of wanted to uh, mention that in the Milwaukee area, that Rainbow Springs, people had haunted stories there. And eventually it would become the site of uh, like weird rituals and animal sacrifices. And then eventually it gets burnt down um, in the early 2000s. Uh, the whole place burns down. Um, more than half of the structure gets destroyed. I'm looking at the Journal Sentinel article from the time. And they're talking to the fire chief. Um, but he's like, oh yeah, the blaze was reported about 2.15 a.m. We tried to do what we could when we got here. A quarter of the building was already gone. Um, and then they're like, well, it was the fire suspicious? And he goes, we're following some leads. Well, that's it. Um, then, uh, you know, they, they never, there was never any arson proven or anything like that, but the place burns down and then the whole property gets sold back to the state uh, to become just like natural state lands. Scott Walker, actually, when he became um, governor, Governor Walker, he fiercely opposed the state buying back Rainbow Springs and that land around Rainbow Springs. So was Scott Walker part of some kind of demonic conspiracy because he didn't want he didn't, oh, yes. <laughs> he didn't want the land opened again? I don't know. I'm just saying it opens some questions. Just saying, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Seems kind of satanic. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So that's just I just wanted to talk about like I feel like that particular place, nobody ever talks about this massive resort that never opened, always rumored to be haunted, home of satanic rituals, and then eventually burns to the ground. And it's, you know, about 25 minutes from downtown. If you yeah. get jump, you that's jump on I-43. And all his satanic furry friends like to hang out. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I heard so, that. Um, it was I, just, the bathroom wall. I thought it was interesting because I just made that connection. So, um, all right. Next story. T, you got another story for us? Yes. Um, we want to get the slides back up and yes, move sir. to the second slide. This story is uh, paranormal and it's also incredibly delicious because um, <laughs> we're going to be talking about, um, uh, I'm seeing the firehouse if you want to move to the next, oh, there we go, yeah, great. I'm gonna be talking about a restaurant in River West where I lived for many years called Cafe Corazon. Uh, and this is the original location. Um, so in 2015, I finished up my book, Monster Hunters. And I was like, you know, I traveled all over the place talking about different stuff. Uh, I wonder if I've, what I've missed in my own backyard. Um, so I decided to write a story about River West ghost stories for the River West Currents, uh, which is a really cool little community newspaper uh, in River West. And I've, you know, I've written for them for a long time uh, here and there. And uh, the former editor, Jan, and the current editor, Lee, are both friends of mine. So I just kind of put it out there on social media. I was like, who has ghost stories about River West? Um, and I got some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, there's a bar that's now unfortunately closed called Dino's Tavern. Uh, they had some ghost stories. There was a uh, former... Um, Milwaukee School of Massage that has also since closed, but they had ghost stories. Oh, and then Allison. That's the same place yeah. as Milwaukee School of Massage used to be? What's that? That's the same place as Milwaukee School of Massage used to be? No, no. They're, they're two separate places. Dino's okay. Tavern and then down the block was the former Milwaukee School of Massage. Okay. They're both supposed to be haunted. Uh, and all these places are pretty close by to each other, by the way. Um, and Allison actually gave me the tip that I should try uh, checking out Cafe Corazon. Um, so again, you know, I just, I kind of walked in there cold one day and I happened to be in the right place at the right time because I asked the bartender and they were like, you know who you should talk to? 
is Justin. He's sitting right over there on his lunch break. And I was like, okay. So I, you know, sat down and introduced myself. And this is what's really great about doing interviews in person is I started talking to Justin and then he's, he's telling me stories, but then he's like, Hey, Hey Dave in the kitchen, come over here. Tell me that thing that happened to you. He's like, Sarah, come over here. And so pretty soon I had like a small group of employees who were gathered around me telling me all about weird stuff that had happened to them in this building. So um, I ended up writing this article and what one of the great things about it was this year the River West Currents had an intern and I was like, yes, I finally get like an intern that can help me out. Uh, her name was Gretchen, and she uh, was really helpful doing some historical research about the different places I talked about. And so she found a couple of great newspaper articles related to this building. So I don't remember when the building was originally built, but uh, it's right by some uh, railroad tracks that are no longer in use. And so it originally was a station. It was more of like a maintenance station for the railroad lines. And then after those tracks stopped being used, it was a general store for a while. But then it had a long history as a bar and it was called um, Augie's Triangle Tap because it's this very unusual sort of triangle shaped building. You can kind of tell that this is the front that we're looking at here and it kind of unfolds into a triangle. Uh, so Augie was the proprietor. He kind of, he changed the names a couple of times. Maybe like uh, this was a business strategy. So it was also called the Lighthouse Tap for a while because it kind of looks like a lighthouse. Um, and his bar was pretty rowdy. Uh, River West was a rowdy place in those days. And uh, apparently his bar was a hangout for the notorious biker gang, the Outlaws. Uh, the Outlaws have a clubhouse here in Milwaukee in um, Walker's Point. And, you know, they're a pretty tough gang. Uh, there was a major incident here. I forget when it was. It was at least 10 years ago, maybe longer, where the FBI and the ATF did a major raid of this Outlaws clubhouse in Walker's Point and arrested a bunch of people and charged them with this sort of ridiculously long list of charges. You know, they were involved in extortion and kidnapping and arms dealing and drug dealing and on and on. So, um, so this bar was probably a pretty rough place and who knows what happened in this bar. We know that at least one person died in this bar because in 1994, uh, Augie, who's a little bit older now. Uh, so this first article we found about the outlaws was from 1977. Augie had to go before the common council and they threatened that they were going to take his liquor license away because they had been getting so many complaints about rowdiness at his bar. So 1977 and then in 1994, we found another article. And in this article, uh, they describe how Augie was opening up his bar when he saw two men wearing ski masks approaching. So uh, he went behind the bar and grabbed a pistol and he sat in the corner of the bar. And when the first person walked through the door, he shot him dead right on the spot in the doorway. Damn, Augie. Uh, and then uh, he had a friend that had sort of a macabre sense of humor because his friend dropped off this plywood coffin that he had made and it had a little sign on it that said, if you try to rob me, I will shoot you and put you in this coffin. Signed, Augie. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we know at least one person died in the bar violently. Uh, the bar shut down and then um, years later, uh, Cafe Corazon opened, which is a really wonderful restaurant. Um, I don't know if you've eaten there, Allison, but they have some oh, nice yeah. vegan vegan options there. I've been there a lot. Yeah, they have a lot of vegan stuff. Uh, one of my favorite places to eat. Um, they're in River West. Uh, I really miss the summer I haven't gotten there, but usually I go at least once with some friends to sit out on their patio. 
enjoy some burritos and uh, margaritas. Um, and but two ghost stories. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> when I go there, I, I try to frequent um, when, when I go out to eat. You know, I haven't found any haunted Thai places, and I love Thai food. That's 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 kind of the big thing that gets in the way. But um, mm -hmm. any other time when I go to a restaurant, I, I try to focus on the haunted places so I can eat my meal and ask for new ghost stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so before I get into the actual stories, there's another reason why people think that this place might be haunted besides, you know, the mur the killing that happened there mm -hmm. and the possible outlaw, whatever happened during that era. And that is if you go into Cafe Corazon and Mike, maybe you could go to the next slide. Um, so the inside is the decoration uh, is really cool because there's all of these religious artifacts all over the walls throughout the whole building. Uh, and the staff told me that they started, you know, with some of their own decorations. But what will happen is uh, some of their customers will have a relative who will die and they will leave behind, you know, these little statues or crosses or stuff. And they might, you know, see this and be like, oh, here's a, a bust of Jesus weeping blood, which is nicely made, but I don't want to keep on to this. But I also don't want to just throw it away. So a lot of these people will bring these items to Cafe Corazon so they can add them to their collection. And the staff seem to think that, you know, maybe these artifacts are holding some energy from these deceased people. And that could explain some of the stuff that's going on um, in the building. I, I just need to say that they, they do have a lot of great artifacts there of sacred hearts and whatnot. Um, yeah. Some really spooky paintings as well. But yeah. my favorite is uh, the, the painting that they have that seems to be of St. Nicholas Cage. That <laughs> seems to be <laughs> St. Nicholas Cage, if you know the one I'm talking about. Um, yeah. They have a holy, a holy painting. Um, and I don't know which saint it's supposed to be. I forget. But but it looks just like Nicolas Cage. It, it will freak you out. Yeah. Um, so I sat down there and I, I started talking to the staff and they started telling me about the weird stuff that goes on in there. So a couple of examples. Um, they also feel much like the uh, West Elm, former Abeda Institute. There's a mischievous little boy that runs around and sort of uh, moves stuff around and hides things as uh, little pranks. So uh, the kitchen staff in particular say that this ghost kind of torments them a little bit by hiding stuff on them and putting things in the wrong places. Although, you know, maybe they're blaming some human error on a ghost there as well. Uh, the waiter I talked to said they have like a storage area on the upper floor. There's a small upper floor. And he said he went up there uh, and he couldn't find the light switch. So he's kind of up there in the dark um, because he needs to get some napkins or whatever. Uh, and he hears this voice whisper, get out. <laughs> so he got out. He ran down the stairs and out of the building. Um, he was very frightened. Uh, the creepiest thing about Cafe Corazon, though, is multiple reports from women. They say that they go into the women's restroom uh, and, you know, they sit down to do their business. And there's a small closet in that bathroom. And they say that it's it kind of sits ajar sometimes and that they will see the face uh, of a sort of ugly old woman who peeks out of this closet at them. Um, and there's at least one instance where someone came running out of the bathroom, uh, very frightened by this experience. Uh, another interesting story related to both of those is this, this waiter uh, that I was talking to, he said that one night he was serving a table and a woman said, um, you know, I'm a psychic and I've got to ask you something. Uh, do you think that this building is haunted? And this waiter was like, uh, yeah, uh, why? And she was like, uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm seeing 
that there's a spirit of an old woman here and also the spirit of a young boy. And this waiter, when he was telling me the story, he was like, this freaked me out so much uh, that I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. And then he showed me his arm and sure enough, he had total goose flesh all the way up his arms, uh, just recalling the story. So um, all these great places, uh, all these great stories about this weird shaped um, little restaurant in River West, which I highly recommend people go to, uh, to get food and maybe have a supernatural experience while you're there. That sounds good to me. I'm ready for, I'm ready for a supernatural margarita. <laughs> at Corazon. Um, awesome. Allison, uh, one more story before we, yeah. before we get, and, and let us know if you guys have any more questions before we wrap up and everything um, and uh, give T a chance to put a capper on the Milwaukee uh, Paranormal Conference online 2020. Uh, so Allison, um, yeah, so what's, what's, not, what's another one that you feel has not gotten the credit you think it deserves? Okay. So um, I have a couple more in the slides. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's go back. Um, oh, yeah. So the, the Milwaukee Theater downtown uh, is a good one. Um, there have been uh, four uh, spirits apparently experienced here, although um, the, they're light on specifics as, as far as uh, stories for the four different spirits. Um, there's... Um, Someone who I, I, I talked to saw uh, the spirit of a, a woman dressed in black um, in, in the bathroom mirror. And uh, so, so that's one that, you know, somebody actually did see this person on, on two occasions uh, in the bathroom dressed as if in mourning. Uh, so it's, it's a beautiful building. Uh, and anytime I hear that a place is haunted, and especially when the management is willing to acknowledge it, I get really excited. I, a lot of times during, um, what I like to do is when we have doors open in Milwaukee every September, of course we didn't have it this September, but um, that's an opportunity for you to get inside like a hundred different buildings downtown during that weekend. And so I always take the opportunity to get in there. And also if, if anybody, uh, is there um, serving as a docent and and knows anything about the building? Of course, I ask him about ghost stories. So uh, when I went into the Milwaukee Theater one year, uh, I was able to uh, talk to one of the management there, and he shared that uh, he had a, a ghost. He had experienced ghosts there, and many of the other employees had. And um, so uh, he also said he wanted a paranormal investigation. So I was able to. Uh, go to a paranormal investigation of the building. Uh, but before doing so, I was shocked to learn uh, about all these different news stories about people who had died in the building. Um, probably the weirdest is that um, if you see uh, that article uh, to the, the lower left, um, there apparently was a, a, baby, a baby chick Association, the International Baby Chick Association. <laughs> this is so weird. That doesn't uh, sound suspect at all. I know it's <laughs> from 1932. I was like, really? There was an International Baby Chick Association? Like they have a whole association just about the babies? That just seemed really weird. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, there was um, a, a, a shooting there uh, because uh, the former president had been ousted recently. And then he um, came back uh, with a with a gun, and um, he shot uh, the current president, and I think he also uh, shot um, the second in command, and then himself. So that's three three deaths. Um, this this other story from 1925 is falling glass. So um, let's see, up above. If you see uh, over here, not the theater, but the one on the left, um, you see the the green kind of ceiling area there. That that those panels used to all be made of glass at one point. Well, certainly in the 1920s, and um, so uh, one day one of those panels fell on a kid, on a like a 10 year old kid, 
um, and killed him uh, right in the atrium there. Uh, but most interestingly to me is um, there was a story that was published in um, 1976, but it was actually about the history of the building and talked about how it during the um, during the 1918 pandemic, uh, the uh, pandemic uh, became so severe. There were so many people that became so ill so quickly that the hospitals overflowed. So they had to make emergency hospitals and they made the Milwaukee theater, one of the emergency hospitals. And so they have a lot of different meeting rooms there or like ballrooms, I guess you would say they do have meetings in them, but uh, they're, they're technically ballrooms. And uh, these ballrooms uh, were, uh, were made into the wards. Like one of them was the men's ward. One of them was the women's ward. And they did have a, a morgue as well. And that's where customer service is today. And um, interestingly, they all ha also have this, this big uh, portrait from another association gathering. It wasn't the International Baby Check Association. It, it was uh, some, some other uh, women's club uh, that had a big meeting there. And uh, they believe that there's actually a ghost in this photo. It, it's a big blow up that's um, out in the, the, a public area. And um, so there's one wom woman in there that um, <laughs> I don't know, you know, maybe she was she just uh, didn't stay still or, or something. I'm not sure why she appears so differently. You'll, you'll see her right in the middle uh, from the other people it, in uh, the photo. Maybe it was a very long exposure. Uh, and she only stayed there for a minute and then put her head down. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, they make it the joke that um, this is their uh, one of the ghosts. And um, it certainly is a weird picture when you look very closely at it. Yeah. Right. Who? Where'd she come from? Yeah, I don't know. So so uh, the Milwaukee Public Theater, I guess uh -huh. that's a good pick. I, I have I have so many, but uh you know, I could leave you with that one today. All right. T, any last stories? Um, yeah. If we want to show a slide of uh, my last slide there, I'll tell the story just very quickly. Yeah. Um, this is a great story for me because it's a, it's a personal one. Um, so from about the year 1999 uh, to about 2008, I worked on and off at a place called the Brady Street Pharmacy. Um, so this picture, you can see the building as it is today is the big picture in the background. It's uh, Gloriosos. Gloriosos started as a very small, beautiful, old school Italian grocery store. Uh, and eventually they moved into this building. And them moving into this building, by the way, is a long story. But in the upper, the black and white photo, you can see how the building originally looked. It was the Astor Theater, uh, which was built in 1915, uh, the same year as that firehouse in the Third Ward. And it was a 950-seat theater. And it was open until 1952 when the age of television, uh, you know, kind of damaged a lot of theater businesses. Uh, so they they closed down and then uh, they use it as a storage space for a lot of film um, until 1983 when my old boss opened it as the Brady Street Pharmacy. And it was sort of an old school soda fountain, greasy spoon diner, and it had a, a pharmacy counter in it. And then it had a convenience store where they sold, you know, over the counter medication and groceries and cat litter and scissors and all sorts of random stuff. So I worked there as a cashier. Uh, one of the reasons I like this place a lot is the first time I walked in, I kind of looked around and there was all these eccentric East Side characters hanging out. And I was like, oh man, this is like a David Lynch movie or something. <laughs> I'm really excited about how weird this place is. Um, so I ended up working there almost 10 years on and off. Uh, probably the most eccentric person in that building was my boss, uh, who was also the pharmacist and the owner of the building. Um, he was married. His wife had died in the 90s. Um, and from what I was told, they had a sort of contentious relationship. 
Uh, they both lived upstairs on the second floor of the building. And, um, you know, they did sort of the Lucy Ricky Ricardo thing where they're very angry at each other. So they actually put a line through the housing on the top floor and he stayed on one side and she stayed on the other side. And they ran a business together, but didn't really have a relationship uh, at, at some point. Um, so she died. And then um, the belief among the employees was very strong that the ghost of Barb, Barb was his, his name, uh, his wife's name. Jim was the owner. Uh, the belief was that Barb was haunting the place and that she was pissed off. So, um, you know, the waitresses would tell me things like doors would slam shut on them and uh, they would feel like there is this sort of a level of animosity of someone looking over their shoulder and that, uh, you know, anything in the building that was seen as uh, being problematic would be blamed on Barb. So I never experienced anything like that myself, but... I just, you know, was probably preoccupied with other things and not thinking about ghosts that much during that point in my life. So, it, but, you know, it's very sad because it was a very unique place. Uh, a very similar place was Oriental Drugs over on North and Farwell was also sort of a diner with um, a little convenience store in it. And those things are kind of relics of the past, I think, unfortunately, because they, they had so much character and they really were sort of the meeting spot of the neighborhood. Um, it's one of the places in my life where I got to like get to know the mailman who delivered mail in the neighborhood and the bartenders across the street at the Roman coin and, you know, all the people that lived in the Brady street area. So it was a good experience. Anyway, that's my last ghost story. Oh, I love you. it. Well, you know, T, I think what you're talking about there is one of the reasons that um, I think things like the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference are important um, because, well, not that we haven't had people from all over the country um, in this particular, you know, in this event, but as far as it's, it's finding the character of a place. And I think that's what the haunted history really does is it makes you feel connected to a place in a, in a special way. You know, when you grow up and you think that everything's going to be, you're like, oh, man, all the TV shows take place in New York or Los Angeles. Uh, even, you know, Happy Days was supposed to take place in Milwaukee. But it's not like Henry Winkler was walking around Milwaukee <laughs> going, hey, he was walking around Southern California. Uh, that's where they shot it. You know, and that's just where the media centers are, of course. And that's because that's where the, the people who can put things together are. Publishing is located in New York. Uh, you know, things like that. And so... Um, you hear all these great horror stories, ghost stories, all the fiction and the TV and movies always seem to be in these faraway places. And then it's discovering that these amazing stories can also happen right in your own backyard, whether it's Topeka, Kansas or Milwaukee, Wisconsin or Miami, Florida or New York City. Um, and then it just, you know, people always talk about Indians have a connection to the land, right? They say my ancestors. That's because there's mythology, there's folklore, there's generations that have been there and you feel that connection. And with a lot of the European settlers, we, you know, like Lisa was talking about in the presentation on the University of Wisconsin that, um, well, 1832 is basically the, once the Treaty of Chicago is signed and uh, the indigenous people are moved out and the European settlers move in, that's kind of when a lot of where we the average Wisconsinite might think that history starts and these kind of stories and connections to even the more obscure places. Um, and even no, right. The, even like little, uh, uh, grocery stores and drug stores have haunted stories. Oh, it's Barb. Oh, she was such a bitch. You know, she's even after she's dead, she's still ruining the place. You know, it's just, right. Some guy says that you're like, what? Who's Barb? She's dead. Yeah. Um, it's things like that that make us really feel connected to a place. And so that's why I think um, events like this are really important so that, that we can know that the place we grew up has just as much interesting and rich history as anywhere any, anywhere else. So um, Absolutely. Uh, anyway, I, wanted, I, I had a really good time. Um, 
like doing the facilitation and the tech stuff for this weekend. And it's been really fun. Uh, if I, this is American ghost walks. We're all part of American ghost walks here in this presentation. Um, Take a haunted history tour at AmericanGhostWalks.com. There's three different ones in Milwaukee. We've got a couple different ones in Madison, Lake Geneva. Uh, we're working on restarting the one in Waukesha. We need some new guides for that. So if you know anybody who might be a good um, tour guide, also let us know. But um, we're just really proud to be part of the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference that I know T has given uh, you know blood, sweat, and tears to uh, over the past six years. So um, I'm going to step out. Allison's going to step out. Please visit us at AmericanGhostWalks.com. Let T say goodbye to everybody. And once again, thank you so much uh, for joining us and making this a really, really fun weekend. Oh. Okay, well, I'm just, uh, I'm not going to talk much longer at all. I just want to take one minute to say uh, a special thanks to Mike. He's been sitting at the control booth uh, this whole weekend, making sure everything runs as smoothly as possible. So I really appreciate his help. I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier, um, which is, you know, if you've seen speakers that you like, uh, this weekend, they've all been uh, giving free presentations. One way that you can support us is to support those speakers that you saw. Um, if they have books for sale, buy their books, their documentaries, their merch. Um, another great way to support them is to just, uh, you know, subscribe to their YouTube channels, follow them on Facebook, drop them a line telling them that you enjoyed seeing their presentation at the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference. Um, all that stuff really helps us out. It's a crazy year. I hope everyone out there is doing well, and I hope that we get to see some of you in person in 2021. Uh, I'm going to announce this now. We actually have Alverno College reserved for September 25th, 2021. Hopefully the pandemic is over by then. Um, thanks for joining us this weekend. It's so great to have you here and hope to see you next year. This is T officially signing off Milwaukee Paranormal Conference 2020. Have a good one.